Our next speaker coming up is the CEO of a software company called NECS. He has recently been brave enough to be a, the first CEO in history to come out and admit that the Mandela effect is a real phenomenon that is really affecting his actual company. He has went as far as to integrate what he calls Mandela Mondays into each work week. Um, he has a meeting every Monday and discusses different Mandela effects with his team. He also owns and operates the quantumbusinessman.com, which is one of the sponsors for this year's event, and has been an instrumental part of pulling all of this together. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome man that I am proud to know, the quantum businessman himself, Mr. Chris Anatra. Thank you, everyone. I first want to say, wow, I'm so happy to be here, so happy to be in Ketchum, so happy to be with all you wonderful people. There is just so much going on. I have so much information to present. Just everybody simmer down. It's going to be OK. Don't <laughs> save your questions for later. Uh, we're going to get through this. It's going to be really interesting. Uh, what Cynthia put together was pretty amazing. She, she laid out the whole Mandela effect principle of what's going on. And I'm going to be going into other aspects of it. Now, as it was said before, I own a company called NECS Incorporated based in Connecticut, and we have a specialized software product for food distribution. And these types of things started to affect my business. But even before that, I myself began to become Mandela affected. So I knew things were happening. And then when it started to affect my business in ways that I couldn't deny, I felt it was a great opportunity to come out and actually express things from another point of view. So. Here I am, I'm happy to be here. I'm really happy to for, this, for the whole support that, that the Mandela Effect community has provided. So it's been really, really amazing and I wanna thank everyone here for that. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna do things a little bit differently right now, okay? <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna start off with a sing-along. I know you weren't expecting that, but here we go. So what I'm gonna do, <laughs> is I am going to start to sing a verse to a song that I know you know. And then I just, when I, I'll start the beginning part, and when I point, that means you guys finish the rest. Okay, you ready? Okay, here we go. 99 bottles of beer on the wall, 99 bottles of beer, take one down, pass it around. 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. That wasn't actually the song, but that was our warm up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here we go. This is the actual song, and I want to do this a little bit differently. The first time that I sing the first part of it, and when I point to you to sing the, the verse that you all know, I want just the guys to sing it, okay? Then I'm going to do it again, and I want just the girls to sing it, and then I'm, we're going to do it again, and then everyone's going to sing it together, okay? Here we go. <laughs> row, row, row your boat. Gently down the stream, merrily, 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 merrily. Gentlemen. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, merrily, 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 merrily. Ladies. Life is but a dream. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, merrily, 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 merrily. Everyone. Life is but a dream. Yes, life is but a dream. Isn't that interesting? It's something that we are all taught from the time we're little kids. Like we know that song. That song is pretty familiar. There's different ways we can sing it. There's different verses and different harmonies and so forth. So I thought that was a good way to begin the process of what I'm going to be talking about. Awakening in the dream. Life is a dream. A dream and a hologram. That song that we just sung is one that we all learn as children. And it's interesting because the system that we're in operates by disclosure. Unless we are told, even if it sounds crazy, unbelievable, fantasy, science fiction, out of this world, unless we, told, 
are told something, it is not allowed into the reality. My perspective right now is that we are all lucid dreaming. And if you think about that, how does that make you feel? Could we possibly be lucid dreaming right now? If you have been experiencing the Mandela effect, you have already begun your awakening process. You are awakening in the dream. Is the Mandela effect real? Well, from my perspective, and I'm sure your perspective, it's, it's pretty real, as real as it gets. And we're all hungry for more information about it. We're all trying to figure out what is going on. So this gathering that we have of all of these minds that we have here that have been experiencing it and the ideas that we can share with each other to help get us closer and closer, step by step, to figuring out what's rational and what's logical and what makes sense regarding this whole Mandela Effect situation. You want to know how reality functions and how our consciousness works. You want to know what's going on. Well, first, let me start off by talking about myself. Who am I? Some of you may have seen uh, the video that I put together. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of a software company called NECS Incorporated. As I mentioned before, my company specializes in creating a very specialized ERP system for food distribution. Now, I created a video in June of 2019 that quickly got over 50,000 hits in a very short period because the video addressed the Mandela effect and quantum physics from a business point of view, which was something that was kind of rare at the time. Now, before I did this, my board of directors was, I, I had a meeting with them and I told them what I was about to do and the video I was about to make and they were like, no, you can't do that. You, can't, you cannot do that because people are gonna lose confidence in our software. You can't, you can't do that. So I'm the captain of the ship, so I had to make an executive decision. I felt it was the right thing to do. I just could not hold it back and I'm really glad that I did. And guess what? It brought me here with you guys, so yeah. And I have to say, my, I'll call it awakening process, for myself, really began with this. The fall of the Twin Towers, mm -hmm. September 11th, 2001. Why did it begin with this? Because I realized something was wrong. I realized that there were just so many things that didn't make sense. When at the time that it was happening, it was devastating. Everyone, like everyone just had a different viewpoint, like a wonderful viewpoint, community came together, etc. But then when all of the facts were coming together about why it actually happened, some things just didn't make any sense. And it began to make me question reality. And it made me question our government and other forces of what we would call domination and control. Why would these things start to happen? So at that point in my life, things are going along pretty well. And then I just had to say, wow, this is like very interesting. Now, when you look at this picture, do you see a Mandela effect? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The stripes, those were never there before. Not, not that I remember. And what, yeah, and, and even when you see the explosions now, they're like really bad, like horrible black smoke coming out like, like I never experienced before. So even the entire, um, the way this happened became a Mandela effect my, to myself and others. And there are other things too that are Mandela effects about this. In 2013, like many of you here, Berenstein Bears, what happened with that? I know it wasn't Berenstein Bears. We all know it wasn't Berenstein Bears. So when that first happened to me, I was reading uh, one of my, my kids at the time, he was three, the Berenstein Bears, and we had like 20 of the books. And I took one off the shelf and it was like Berenstein Bears. And I'm like, wow, someone misprinted the book. I actually thought it was a misprint. So I put, it, I put it back. I looked at the other ones. They all said Berenstain. In one day, in one night, the, the night before they were Berenstain, the next day they were Berenstain. And now at that time, my software company was putting out this big uh, release and I just didn't really have any time to look into this any further. Um, there was one point too, I thought someone broke into my house and replaced all the books with defective <laughs> copies. Like why would someone do that? It didn't make any sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, so kind of put it on the shelf, literally. Time went on. And then 2017, I began to have, a, I had a spiritual experience that began another process of me questioning reality. And it introduced me to something called the Akashic Records. Now, I don't know if anyone here has heard of the Akashic Records before. Okay, I see some heads shaking yes and no. At the time, I had no idea what that was. I was like, Akashic what? Like, what, what is this all about? But it was something that really, um, I won't give you the details, but it was something that really awakened me to the core at the time. And then for those of you that don't know what the Akashic Records are, it's re if you're a gamer, let's say, for example, you're playing a game and you want, you, let's say you die in a certain level and you want to play back the last five minutes of the game, that's kind of like with the same concept of the Akashic Records. Everything that's going on in our reality is being recorded, which is a very fascinating subject. And that led me into something called reincarnation. I'm like, what? Reincarnation? That's ridiculous. Who could believe in reincarnation? That's the way that I was always taught. And then that led to other things. And then this Mandela effect hit me hard. Like a lot of people here. The JFK assassination, November 22nd, 1963. I was uh, in, my, in my kitchen. I had a couple of friends over. And we were talking about how Trump was going to re be releasing so, some new information from the Warren report. And we were wondering what that could possibly be. And I was like, oh, yeah. And Zabruder, uh, and the Zabruder, Zabruder film, frame 237, showed blah, blah, blah. So we were talking about it. And I went to bring it up on the computer. And I'm like, what is this? Is somebody like, <laughs> I, I thought it was like April Fool's or something. Like someone actually like changed all of the, the, the Zabruder films. Different angle. There's six people in the car, uh, governor of Texas and his wife. In, my, in the reality, I remember they were in the limo behind. And now the governor of Texas gets shot. He gets shot in the leg. Uh, all these different, all the, the whole chain of events happens differently enough to make you say, wow. Especially for someone like me that was always like, I watched this video hundreds of times, especially as a kid, trying to figure out who the shooters were. Was the CIA involved? You know, blah, blah, blah. So, Mandela effects began to affect my software business. As I said, it, it has to do with food distribution. Customer data and names of established items would change and be different from the client's memory. Now, some examples that you would all know about is, of course, Stouffer's Stovetop Stuffing. We all, have, most of us here, I would say, have heard of Stouffer's Stovetop Stuffing. It's one of those product names that's hard to forget. So, Customers would call, what happened to my Stouffer stovetop stuffing? Somebody keeps changing it back to Kraft stovetop stuffing. What's going on with this? And same thing with the avocados, like Haas avocados became Haas avocados. And, P and Macintosh apples, you know, McIntosh apples, etc. So it, it became very interesting. It helped, one of the things it helped me do is understand how timelines work. And I'm going to explain this to you a little bit with how I was able to investigate this in my software business. But what happened was through this whole experience, and I was already like understanding what the Mandela effect was, it was an opportunity to bring the Mandela effect out in a, from a business point of view. So today, my goal is to answer four questions. These are, these are four pretty big questions. If I could answer this, it's, your admission fee has been paid, is all, I, is all I can say. So number one, why is it happening, right? Why? Number two. Are we in a dream or a holographic universe? Does that make sense? I wasn't taught that in school. Um, number three, what are timelines and how do they work? And number four, what is causing the Mandela effect? Why is it happening? So let's address the first question. It's part of our awakening process. It's an alarm clock going off. Every time a Mandela effect comes into our reality, we have the choice to either say, wow, I need to investigate this more, or hit the snooze button. I need to go back to sleep for a while. You know, I need to pay my bills. I need to put food on the table. I can't worry about these, these crazy Mandela effects. And when we speak to others about it, we're going to get mixed reactions because it's difficult to process for both who we speak to and ourselves. And one of these examples has to do with my, my parents and the Bible. So I was, I was brought up in a religious type of household. And I was talking to my parents about the Mandela effect. And I said, Dad, there's this Mandela effect about the JFK assassination. 
and there's six people in the car and I'm going on and he's like, of course there are six people in the car. Of course the governor of Texas gets shot. And I'm like, dad, who are you? Like, what's going on? So, but I knew he was into the Bible. He used to teach Bible classes. So um, there were some scriptures I knew he was familiar with. One is in the book of John and um, the other one's in the book of Isaiah. So I said, dad, get out, get out your Bible and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about some of these Mandela effects. So actually before he did that, I said, you know, in John 18, 20, Jesus, I said, fill in the blank, dad, where two or blank are gathered in my name. And my father's like, more, two or more. And I'm like, that's not what it says anymore. It says, where there are two or three. And he's like, it's like, what? That doesn't even, <laughs> he's like, but that doesn't even make any sense. He's like, what if there are four people? Then Jesus isn't there anymore. I'm like, I know it says that. And then I, the other one was in, from the book of Isaiah, the lion with the lamb, which we, a lot of us have heard of that expression before we know about that. And I said, now, dad, now it says the wolf and the lamb. And he's like, you know, he's like, I know what the problem is. It's the translation you're looking at. So he goes back into his bedroom. He pulls out like seven Bibles, uh, new, you know, King, J King James, a Gideon. He got a hotel. He has all the Bibles out. And he's looking at John 18, 20 and, and, and Isaiah. And he's like, he just, he doesn't understand what's going on. He just, he's looking at all, the, and every single one of the versions says where two or three, or the wolf will lie down with the lamb. He doesn't know, it's, he just doesn't get it. Very shocked. My mother is very shocked too. She doesn't understand it. But then they just kind of phase out. They tune out. They go back and they turn on Fox News. And I'm like, whoa, this is, we're, talking, <laughs> we're talking about something really important here. So, but that's, that's just, that's the kinds of reactions that I've got. And I think you guys are getting the same type of reactions. Now to add a little flavor to this whole thing, um, I, shot a, I shot an interview with my parents. And I, at the end of the interview, I got them to agree on a particular Mandela effect that we all agreed on. So I'm gonna now entertain you with this, uh, this interview with my parents. So we, we will start this. Hi, I'm here with my parents, Victor and Heather. Nice to have you here. It's fun being here, yeah. So I've been doing these videos about Mandela effects that you guys are somewhat aware of. I kind of force you to watch them from time to time. <laughs> so I figured I'd, I'd talk to you guys about it because, you know, sometimes you're skeptical of it and sometimes it's like, wow, that makes sense. I definitely remember things mm -hmm. a certain way. So I wanted to have just a little conversation with you about some different things. So the first thing is, well, don't forget that I'm known now as the quantum businessman. So. Yeah, oh, I know, wow, I know that's it's a surprise. Yes, it's the, <laughs> my new moniker. I even have a tagline that goes, the universe is of commerce. Wow, that's yeah. deep. Yeah. It's deep. <laughs> so, um, and also, too, it kind of like the whole business thing um, kind of runs in the family, right? Because we call ourselves, what, an entre uh, An entrepreneurs. An entrepreneurs. <laughs> Instead of an entrepreneur, we're an entrepreneurs. Now, we've talked about Mandela effects before. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how it goes. Like, for example, Dad, I remember originally talking to you about the JFK assassination, yep. right? Now, I was like really excited about it. Like, wow, who are these two extra people? The governor of Texas and his, and his wife and the governor of Texas gets shot. And what was your reaction? Yeah, I, that's, that's the way I remember it. And there's a whole thing called the magic bullet? Yeah, yeah. Get shot in the leg, no one knows how that bullet yeah. deflected or got. So to me, it was like totally, totally new. And for you, it's like, of course, there's always six people in the car. So those type of things. But some things like did affect you guys the same way. So when I talked to you about some of the Bible things, for example, um, the blank will lie down with the lamb. Do you remember that one? Sure. Right. Do you, what do you remember it as being? As the lion. The lion. The lion. Yeah. And do you remember what it is now? Uh, the wolf, is it? Yes, the wolf. So that was like a big one because I remember mm -hmm. that clearly. And the other one was, I think it was Matthew 18 where Jesus said, where two or blank are gathered in my name. Right. Yeah. Do you remember what, he, what you remember it? Two at, or more. Right. More, yeah. and you know what it is now? Uh, two or three. I don't, I don't blame <laughs> you if you remember it is now because these timelines are like confusing I, I, everyone. But now it's like where two or three are gathered oh, in my name. And that doesn't really make sense, right? Two mm -hmm. or more. 
What happens right. if there's four people, right? Exactly. And he's not there anymore. The more yeah. sounds better. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, you know, we have different, differing opinions when it comes to this. And you know about the first video I made, you know, uh, it had to do with like avocados. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, that was weird. So, Mom, how do you, Mom, how do you remember how the, the avocado that starts with an H is spelled? H double A S. Does that sound familiar to you? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's surprising that it's now H A, H -A double S. Yeah, Hess. Yeah. So I went from Haas to Hess. And even that product, um, the stuffing mix. Stouffer's, yeah. Stouffer's, stovetop yeah. stuffing. Yeah. It's never existed. Oh, that doesn't make sense. I know. Everybody <laughs> remembers. Well, these things don't, <laughs> don't make sense to everyone right off the bat, but then quantum physics and timelines begin to answer those questions. But just so everyone in the audience has an idea about these are some of the things that we talk about. We don't agree on, with everything, and that's okay. That's how Mandela effects work. We're all from different timelines. We have our, we, our consciousness remembers things from different timelines. Um, I thought it was interesting, too, about how um, the other month you were at my house and you showed me a picture of a black egret. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was like, what is this? And then you said, no, that's like a, a black heron, right? Or something like that? Right. And then I went online and I'm like, like, you both discovered new Mandela effects because I don't ever <laughs> remember there being black egrets or black herons or black cranes. You know, even their beaks are black. So to me, that was like a Mandela effect. So you, congratulations, you just, you didn't know it, but wow. you both identified two Mandela effects, at least for me anyway. So one of the things I wanted to do is just see if you, this is a specific music Mandela effect. And I wanted to see if this is something that you remember a certain way. So this is a song by John Denver. Now I know you both know the song. It's uh, that song about Take Me Home, Country Roads. Right. Okay, so what I wanna do is on my phone, I have this song queued up to play. And I want you to tell me if you remember this the way it is, and we're just talking about the title of the song. Okay. And just so you know, it's it's uh, John Denver's, and the, the title of the song is Country Road. Country Road. Okay. Here we go. Country Road. Okay. Country Road. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Country Road. Right there. Country Roads. Do you remember it being singular or plural? Were roads going to take him home? <sighs> Was it like country road? No, I know that song really well. It's road. No, no. Singular, right? Yes. Yeah, I remember it. I'll tell you, like, I remember as a kid in the back seat of the car yes. with the 8-track with the track John Denver tape. <laughs> it's like hearing yeah. it like a gajillion times. Yes. Yeah, so it was always country road. Take me home, country Absolutely. road. Absolutely. And now in this timeline, it's always been country roads. The title of the song is country roads. Everything is country roads now, plural instead of singular. So that's an example of a Mandela effect that we all agree with. Yeah, that's So good. woo! All right, we, yeah. we did it. Yeah. We came together and um, yes. we identified Very a, a timeline yeah. that we all remember, that we're yeah. all part of. So yeah, so is there anything that you would like to say? Like, um, anything at all? <laughs> you've, got, you've got the floor. How do you feel about these Mandela effects, Dad? Well, it's, uh, it's extremely interesting because there's no real answer, you know, that, uh, or logical answer. And it becomes, uh, you, you kind of say, well, did I remember it correctly? Or maybe, maybe it was me that misremembered it. But it's, uh, and then, then sometimes you, you just, that's not the answer. The answer is so obvious that there, there is a change. Uh, but it's, it's, it's hard to uh, explain, you know. And to understand, that's, that's my opinion of it. It is first hard to get your head around, for sure. Yeah. Mom, what do you feel about Mandela effects? Well, I, I do. I find it curious and interesting. And some, you can say, well, that's just memory or, you know, something else other than that. But there are a few things, like the country road, that that one particularly, because I knew that song really well. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, another one um, is from a Walt Disney movie, Snow White. When the queen, the evil queen, looks in the mirror, what does she say? Mirror, mirror on, on the, wall, the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Right, mirror, mirror on the wall. Right. You know what she says now? What? <laughs> <laughs> magic mirror. And it's always been magic mirror on the wall. And for a lot of people, it's like, nope, it's no. always been mirror, mirror. Yeah. 
but in the original Disney film and afterwards, it's always been magic mirror on the wall. Wow. Now what's interesting, one of the things I'm starting to find is happening to people is that it's getting hard for them. They can almost remember it both ways. And that's part of a oh. concept of us becoming multidimensional. Like we begin to remember things that we've experienced on other timelines. Mm -hmm. Like for example, um, there's a famous composer, Beethoven. Do you remember what Beethoven's like whole name was? I'll give you the first name, Ludwig. No. You don't know Beethoven? I don't Ludwig know his Beethoven. full name. I, I just <laughs> call him Beethoven. Uh, Ludwig von Beethoven? Oh, Does okay, that sound familiar? sure, yes, yeah. of course. Okay. So now in this timeline, he's always been Ludwig van Beethoven. Not von? Not von. It, he went, it switched from V-O-N, which a lot of people remembered, mm -hmm. to V-A-N, van. But what happens is sometimes people will get confused and they're like, wait, I remember it both ways. I remember van Beethoven and I remember von Beethoven. Yeah. So that's, that's what we call becoming multidimensional. You begin to like have memories of, of multiple timelines. So it it's gets even more difficult <laughs> right. to put these things into perspective. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, it's all very interesting. Yes, so I want to continue to um, invite you to watch my videos. And, do. you know, give a little like and maybe say a nice comment. <laughs> and, right. Yeah. You got we it. will. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I've got, I've got two likes in the can for this video already. If I don't get at least two sure. likes, something's from wrong. From your mom and dad. Yeah, from my mom and dad, no less. Yeah. Maybe if there is a love button, I make sure that you do hit the love one. Okay, we'll look for the love. Well, I think like is all you have, so we'll go with that. Okay, that'll do. Well, thank you very much. It's been fun, Chris. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Country roads, huh? Country <laughs> roads. Country roads. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go home on my country road. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you. You're well. You You're well. Mom and Dad, yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, um, at the end of my presentation, I'm going to be presenting proof positive that the Mandela effect is real. So. Fasten your seatbelts for that one. Okay. So, why, to continue, why is it happening? Not everyone will be awakening at the same time. You can call it a wake-up date. We all have something that I'm going to call, you can call it as well, a wake-up date. And as excited as we can be to share a Mandela effect with other people, many just won't be able to even grasp the concept. They may even become irritated. Because it's not, it's not their time. It's not their time to wake up. And if that happens, the, probably the best thing to do is drop the subject, especially around the family. You know, politics, religion, Mandela effects. We're going to add that <laughs> one to it as well. But what's going to happen, too, is as you see, you'll have certain friends in your life that kind of exit your friendship. Like, you just don't resonate with them anymore. But a whole new set of friends will start to come into your life. It's something very, it's a very interesting phenomena. So overall, I find that to be a very positive thing because that definitely has happened to me as well. Now, awakening to what? What are we awakening to? Awakening to understanding what the truth of our reality is. Awakening to understand that quantum theory, quantum physics, etc., is correct. And one of the proofs is going to be the Mandela effect. Awakening to understanding that we are much, much, much more than what we, were, that what we were ever taught and that our consciousness does traverse timelines. We are multidimensional. And even though our physical body may die, our consciousness is immortal. Awakening to understanding as an individual why exactly we are here on the Earth hologram. So, Cynthia brought forward some great information. Is this a hologram? Is this a simulation? Is this a game? Is this a dream? Is it a school? Is it a prison planet? Is it a human DNA farm? Is it all those things? So now the next thing I want to address is, are we in a holographic universe? So we'll talk about the atom. And there's this, there's this joke that my kids tell me, like, how come you can't trust an atom? Because they literally make up everything. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> so, 
So <laughs> we know an atom is 99.999, uh, 1296% empty space. That's a lot of empty space. So the illustration that I use that some of you may have seen in one of the videos I put together has to do with a sugar cube. So if you were to remove all of the empty space from all of the atoms, from all the seven billion plus people that are alive on the planet right now, they would all easily fit into the volume of a sugar cube. Does that make sense? Nikola Tesla said, if you wish to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration. Light equals photons. Photons are energy, frequency, and vibration. A hologram is a projection of light. Even uh, Professor Stephen Hawking, his final theory was the universe is a hologram. And there have been a lot of books written on the subject. This is one of my favorites, um, The Holographic Universe. You probably should have a dictionary on one side of you and a, and a quantum physicist on the other as you read it, but it's very deep and it, it really addresses the subject really, really nicely by Michael Talbot. Something that's interesting about a hologram, okay, a real, like a, if you can construct a hologram, if you cut a hologram in half, each half still contains the entire hologram. And if you cut it in half again, it still contains the entire hologram. It's pretty amazing, again and again and again. You are a piece of the universal hologram. A piece of the hologram contains the entire hologram. You contain the entire universe. It's something called the law of one. Now, one of the things that we are struggling with, that, I'm, that I've been struggling is, in, is why is this holographic reality so difficult to wake up in. Part of the reason is because we're in a hologram, in my opinion, that's been hacked. It's been hacked so that we do not awaken as we are supposed to, so that our energy goes through a harvesting process lifetime after lifetime. The karmic things that we're supposed to be resolving lifetime after lifetime, we don't, we're not doing that. And this is where we all come in. We're going to help awaken a world in end domination and control. So basically having a gathering like this, and a lot of you guys have like your own YouTube channels, you're really like talking about it to people, you're really passionate about the subject. I believe you guys, us all, we're all renegades. We're the ones that are really gonna bring the message to people and we're gonna be relentless about it because as time goes on, as time marches on, people are gonna to begin to, it's gonna become undeniable. There's gonna be such crazy Mandela effects People are going to be looking for answers, and guess what? We're right now, we're putting those answers together, and we're formulating them. Imagine, imagine, could Earth be a quantum computer? Now, don't forget, you're talking to a software guy here, so the, these type of things make like a lot of logical sense to me, but think about it. We know the power of quantum computers. Uh, Google just had a paper released the other week of showing the supremacy of quantum computers, how they can do a calculation in seconds that would take a supercomputer the size of this hotel 10,000 years to do the same calculation. Pretty amazing. Imagine that the Earth is sentient, that the Earth is aware. Imagine that the Earth has a feminine nature. Imagine that the Earth holds the DNA from around the universe. And when you just look at the diversity of all different types of life, whether it be on the surface or under the, under the seas or in the air, there's so much diversity. What does that all possibly mean? It's really important things to consider along with dreams. Dreams are subconscious imaginings that contain sounds, images, and other, sound, other sensations while you sleep. Dreams are holographic. Dreams are something that we've all experienced. We probably have even experienced, experienced dreams that we thought were real. And then you wake up and like, wow, I thought that, I, that was really happening. Like, so dreams are a very important part of understanding everything that's going on. Me dreaming you, you dreaming me, Earth Mother dreaming all of us. And recording that in the Akashic Record as memories stored in light. Our dreams hold the clue to what reality is. 
And really, they can't take our dreams away. Every time we go to sleep and our body goes into sleep paralysis and we start going into the dreaming process, that's something that's very unique and it's, there's, there are experiences that we share. And dreams are so important too because they could help guide us into our future and give us symbolisms and things to help us understand things that are going on around us that our subconscious may know pretty clearly. And that's the best way for our for the dreams to communicate to the more aware person, especially if we can remember our dreams. They are always there to remind us. Next, next topic, what is a timeline? So I have this illustration of all these different train tracks coming in. The train tracks are gonna symbolize different timelines and how they can intersect. And it reminds me of this train, big train station in New York City called Grand Central Station. Not anymore. <laughs> It's Grand Central Terminal, and it's always no. been it, it's always been Grand Central Terminal. So, <laughs> it's true. Uh, so timelines. Now, as I mentioned before, my first clue as to how timelines worked related to Haas avocados and my customers' data. So I thought this was going to be a real easy one to solve, right? I go back like a few years and I, I find all these invoices that say H-A-A-S, right? That's logical because I know of definitely a few years ago I was buying Haas avocados, so I should be able to go back and actually look at hard copy printouts to show it. Guess what? And this is just an example. I don't know how clearly you can see it. This is a, a sample. Um, invoice that I, I had always used on these different presentations I would do when I would uh, have a food distribution company that was interested in my software. And this is from 2000, I can't even read the date, um, 2014 maybe. It says Hass Avocados. And now I remember when I would give, the, give these demonstrations, in my head I'd, I'd always go Hass Avocados. I'd always say H-A-A-S. I'd always pronounce it that way. And it was always the last item on all of our, our demo invoices. So when I went back and I, and I looked what they were, they all had switched to H-A-S-S. -S. So that began to give me a clue as to how these timelines work. Once you switched into a timeline where it's always been that way, you picked up all the data from that timeline, so to speak. Now, there's also the concept of future timelines. These are timelines that have infinite possibilities like intersecting train tracks. Anything that can be conceived or imagined exists. Thoughts and decisions create reality. They can manifest as actual experiences. Now the other concept are what we call past timelines. These are timelines that we consciously remember. We remember Stouffer stovetop stuffing, we remember Haas avocados, et cetera, et cetera. We also remember a time when the Mona Lisa didn't smile. At least I do. That was the thing. How come she's not happy? Um, but do we remember something called the Islesworth Mona Lisa? Okay. Check this out. This is something I had no... This is something that just came into my reality. There's a few, few new things about the Mona Lisa. So here's the Islesworth Mona Lisa. It has now been... or It has been for a while authenticated uh, by people in the art world that that was painted by da Vinci 10 years before the original Mona Lisa. Now, I had never heard of that before. So here's Mona Lisa 10 years younger, and here's the current Mona Lisa, and there's been some changes with her too. She's got a little bit of a smile going on. She used to have her hands clasped in her lap. Now she's like sitting on a chair, and it looks like an arm is, one of her arms is resting on the chair, and the other arm is clasped over it. And her hair has also gotten a little straighter as well. And you can't see it in this picture, but it looks like there's a little like black doily thing on the top of her head. So these are things that I had no idea about, just like the Islesworth Mona Lisa? I'm sorry, I never heard of that before. And another past timeline that, okay, these are the things that shake me up. Okay, Marilyn Monroe. I remember when she had her famous beauty mark that was above her lip, below her uh, left nostril. Now it's on her left cheek. Her beauty mark is over here. I remember it being under here. So the, you know, these are the little things that bother me. These are, these are the things that keep me up at, at night. <laughs> so, but these are all examples of past timelines. 
Now, there are something called convergence points or nodal points or jump points or intersection points. It's a concept that all has the same, different names of the same type of concept. It's basically where multiple timelines come together and merge. So like the, like the, like train tracks. And these, we'll call them jump points here. These jump points appear as in front of you because we experience time as linear. And it is said that having in the Earth hologram experience, we have a very different experience because time in our perception only moves forward, so to speak, frame by frame. And that time in other parts of the universe does not operate that way. They call it no time. So when you come to Earth and you have an Earth experience, a lot of times it's confusing to be in, in a linear experience versus one where time operated in a completely different manner. So here's an example of these jump points or nodal points. This is a little bit more of a simple uh, train tracks uh, simulation, but you can see how different tracks could come in and they could hit a certain point where they come together and instead of like your life taking different paths to get to another jump point, there is the way to do something called quantum jumping, which Cynthia may know a little bit about. And if you want to know more about it, there might be a, some books back there that address the topic as well. So from a higher perspective, when one looks down upon time, and you can see these multiple tracks coming in from all different directions, you can see jump points like a flower blooming. You, you can quantum jump instead of weaving all around to the next jump point. So here's another example. This is the Fibonacci uh, sequence and how you've got all these different spirals so instead of you taking a timeline to go from here to here, you might you know, take all different paths to do it, but you might want to just jump from here to here, take the quickest path so that you can get whatever results that you're looking for. Also too, Earth will plant timelines for you in her flower garden of possibilities. So we have all these different decisions we can make, and Earth herself, Earth the quantum computer, let's call her that, um, she can actually plant for you different timeline possibilities for things that you may never actually would have tried or a version of you may not have actually tried or attempted that you can actually go and access yourself at some point. Pretty far out stuff, right? You can quantum jump as an individual. You can quantum jump as a group. Hey, let's do that now. Um, <laughs> or you could quantum jump as an entire planet as the consciousness of a planet can, can rise everyone could hit another jump point as well. Our memories are merged with memories of the converged jump point. So the Mandela effect is the consequence of jumping timelines while holding memories of the previous timeline. That's why some people are beginning to have dual memories. So that interview with my parents who talked about Beethoven, and I've, and I've mentioned a Beethoven example to some people and some other examples. And people really get confused. They're like, wait, Van Beethoven? Maybe it was Van Be no, Von Beethoven. So there are those type of things that are happening because we are beginning to become aware of other versions of ourself with those memories that, came, that experienced that particular timeline. Quantum jumping causes an acceleration of consciousness. Guess what, guys? All of, everyone here, all of your consciousnesses are accelerating right now. That's what's happening. And that's why you're so hungry for more and more information. And the individual in a new timeline can retain the memories of a previous timeline. These retained memories are the Mandela effect. Some individuals may retain awareness and memories of two or more of their selves from previous timelines. And if you're experiencing the Mandela effect, you're, you are becoming what's called multidimensional. You are becoming aware of other realities and other timelines. Now, I have a personal example of when I recently met with an attorney, um, probably about five or six months ago. Now, I was talking to him about some, some business things. Now, I had never met him before, and he had a very unique name where, you know, I would remember that name and I re would remember what he looked like. And after we had our, our meeting, he's like, uh, so, like, how, he's like, Chris, how come, you know, you don't remember who I am? And I'm like, no, this is the first time we ever met. And he's like, no, like, don't you remember like 15 years ago you had that software 
uh, developer guy in London that you wanted to bring into the US, and I helped you bring him in for that health insurance software system you were writing. And I'm like, what? Health insurance software? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but what's interesting is about, in that time, maybe 20 years ago, my father used to be in the health insurance business. And we lived in Connecticut, and at that time, Hartford, Connecticut was the insurance capital of the world. And he had made a contact for me. I think it was an Aetna or one of those big companies that was looking for this great big system to be written. As it turned out, in this timeline, it kind of fizzled out. It didn't turn into be, to do anything, and I was focusing on my food software anyway. But it, it was possible that I could have, as soon as he said it, I'm like, wow, you know, I was looking into writing software for the health insurance industry, and I never wound up doing it. So this is something that happened to me. So this is someone that he knew me, I didn't know him. So this experience happened to me. So my bet is it's going to start happening to you guys as well. You're going to have people come up to you and remember certain things about you, and you're going to be like, I don't know what you're talking about, and they're going to be very definitive about it, just like we are with certain Mandela effects. So I believe this is a, a future thing that we're going to be experiencing more and more. So when it comes to timelines, can you bring in the resources of other timelines? Yes. What does that mean, resources of other timelines? Remember, a lot of people probably saw that video with Jordy Rose from D-Wave Quantum Computers where he talked about harvesting the resources of other timelines. What's that about? I might answer that question in a few minutes. Next, timelines can collapse and merge. Can you gain advantage by this? Yes, you can actually. Can timeline events be spliced and merged into a dominant timeline? Yes, they can. For example, if you have a disease, can you quantum jump to another timeline to bring in another timeline where you never experienced that disease? Yes, absolutely. There is a concept known as a negative timeline holographic insert. Now, an example of this would be the 9-11 Twin Tower attacks. So that whole situation just didn't make any sense, the whole story. Like, when you, when you really look into it, and I don't really want to that's not my role to, to talk about that. But it raises enough questions to know that there are enough things that weren't in sync for it to actually flow and actually happen. So that would be an example of something called a negative timeline holographic insert. Why, why would that happen? Like, why would beings want that to happen? And it is said that there are beings that have technology to be able to create and insert these into this reality. So. Another negative holographic timeline insertion example has to do with World War II. It has to do with the Nazis. It has to do with U-boat attacks sinking ships off the New England coast. Now, is anyone familiar with that? The whole concept where the Nazis in, I think it was 1941 or 42, uh, they sank um, all of these ships and over 5,000 people were killed. Now, for myself, I had never heard about that, especially living in New England. That was like big news. So that would be an example. There were more people killed off the New England coast by Nazis in this timeline than were killed in Pearl Harbor, which is pretty interesting. They even sailed into New York Harbor and sank an oil tanker. Uh, have any of you heard of that? No. OK. Watch this. This is from the Smithsonian. Institution, in, I don't even know. I can't keep track anymore. After three weeks at sea, the glow of New York City proves an irresistible beacon. Harding could see the whole skyline of New York, something probably every German dreamt of before the war. The captain invites his crew up to the bridge to see the lights of Manhattan. But U-123 isn't here to sightsee. As they leave New York Harbor, the stern watchman spots a ship approaching from the rear. Hartigan 
You see it's fully lit up against the lights of New York. A tanker, a nice large juicy tanker. At close to 7,000 tons, British oil tanker Coimbra cruises unescorted out of New York Harbor. Captain Lieutenant Hardigan maneuvers his submarine into attack position with textbook precision. It's part of the game of the U-boat commander to be cool, to be resolute, to be cold-blooded, at least to appear so, to create confidence within his crew. Just 800 yards from the target, Torpedo fire. he launches his first torpedo. 58 seconds later, a hit. OK, so how many people have heard of that? I, I had never heard of that before. So right in New York Harbor. Now, to, so this gets even more interesting. So to, because the, US, the US, US Navy was unprepared for this to happen. So what happened was something called the Hooligan Navy was formed. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Hooligan Navy, but what it was is pri private yachts and fishing boats were painted gray, and they would go out and pick up survivors off the New England coast and off the east coast of the United States. And they actually saved hundreds of people. There would have been far more than, than 5,000 that were killed if it wasn't for the Hooligan Navy. And even Ernest Hemingway was its mascot. I don't know. I don't, so they, it, goes, it, goes even, it goes even further than that as well, because someone famous like Her Ernest Hemingway, he actually, one of his uh, yachts, he was sailing in around Florida, I believe. He had this plan of throwing, like going onto a U-boat and throwing grenades down into the U-boat and exploding it that way. There was also a rumor he had more alcohol on, the, on his yacht than he did grenades, but that's a whole other subject. <laughs> but to, to add some, some credence to this, I want to show something from, this is a news broadcast that was celebrating, we're talking about the Hooligan Navy. Now, I'm from New England. I'm from Connecticut. <laughs> These are things that I have never heard about before. And in the town that I live near, it's called New Haven, Connecticut, they built this big, beautiful bridge called the Pearl Harbor Memorial Bridge. You know, in dedication to all the men and women whose lives were lost in Hawaii, you know, on the, on the other part, what happened about the 5,000 that were killed right there? So there's a lot of these things that don't make sense. So watch this other part will be, uh, will be somewhat uh, brief here. It's uh, the news broadcast is from 2011. I think it's actually before 2011, but it was posted on YouTube around 2011. The waters off Long Island are renowned for their beauty and tranquility, but during World War II, they were a battleground. At night, you look in the sky and you can see a great big ball of fire. That means that something was being sunk not too far away. Jack Fisher of Greenport watched as Nazi U-boats sank 160 Allied cargo ships in two months. So in 1941, he volunteered to join the fight with a ragtag bunch of locals who earned the nickname the Hooligan Navy. We didn't know exactly what we were looking for or what we had to do. Fisher, in fact, got seasick on his first patrol. Even more astonishing was the fact that the hooligans faced the sophisticated Nazi subs in wooden sailboats. As these rarely seen home movies show, the donated vessels were painted military gray and outfitted with World War I machine guns. Well, the machine gun was so rusted, and uh, we never even attempted to use it. The group patrolled East Coast waters for the Nazi subs, and if seen, radioed in their position. Most of the men were like Fisher 4F, unable to join the regular Navy. But they were the undermanned military's only answer to the Nazi threat. That's why Ted Webb's Greenport Museum honors the so-called picket patrol to this day. Oh, this was a story of, of heroism, patriotism, um, wanting to protect our homeland. There's no record of any German U-boat that was sunk or captured because of the picket patrol's work. But Jack Fisher says he learned firsthand just how effective the group was when he met with a former U-boat commander after the war. He just said, I hated you bastards. I traveled 3,000 miles and I have a sailboat pick me up. 
Now 89, Jack Fisher is one of the last hooligans left, a living reminder of what Americans do when the chips are down. Yeah, see, there we go. Very, very interesting. Um, yeah, this is another, uh, uh, another thing that's going to be coming into our awareness. Some of you may have already uh, have heard of the Tartarian Empire. Um, it's something that has been erased from history, kind of like a Mandela effect type of a thing. And that's going to be coming more and more into our awareness. Uh, that's a whole other subject. If you want to research that, there are lots of people like online that are making videos about it. And I feel like this is like super important as well, the whole Tartarian Empire and how like history has really changed. So when you look at those examples of what happened with the Nazis, and there's a lot more. I actually created a two-part uh, video series about this that I hope to post in a few weeks. And um, it actually um, made me want to take this trip to Germany to do some things you can watch the videos, but to help like stop these holographic insert type things from happening. So there are when you when you discover these things and you discover there are things you can do to help change the reality, you're going to do it. That, and that's that's I was motivated to do that as well. And then you'll I'll be expressing about this more, and you can you'll see those videos as soon as they're finished uh, being edited. Now, I want to talk about a positive example of something called uh, like these um, holographic insert type things. Imagine you own a hotel chain. Now, by the way, just everyone settle down when I talk about this. This is something that I, I felt that um, is appropriate. And don't take this as gospel, but let it like sit with you and see if it resonates with you type of a thing. Imagine you own a hotel chain and you have 270 locations, primarily in the United States. However, in other timelines, you've got over 4,000 locations across the world. Now, let's say there have, let's say Earth, who can approve timeline changes and merges, she sees the need for more positive hotels across the planet because one of the things we're going to begin to realize as time marches on is that different parts of our planet, different parts of the hologram, vibrate at different frequencies. And when you visit those different parts of the planet, your DNA gets an upgrade from it, from the frequency that that part of the planet is vibrating at. So when people begin to, as people begin to more awaken and they begin to understand these concepts, there's going to be a lot more people traveling of different parts of the world, whether that's Egypt or you know, wherever that might possibly be, wherever you're especially called to, especially if your heritage is from a certain area, those are certain places that you're definitely going to want to visit. Now, in this example that I'm giving, um, let's say that chain just happens to be named Best Western, okay? Where we are right now. Now, Best Western, um, now, I used to do a lot of traveling, starting in the 90s. Um, for 20 years, I, was, I would get on so many airplanes, it would like almost make me sick every time I'd get on like, another airplane, I gotta travel somewhere else. So always booking hotels and so forth. And there were Best Westerns around, but not, not as many as there are now. Now, Best Western did, uh, did recently have a logo, legit logo change um, from 2015. However, the, the logo is new for me. Um, with all the traveling I, I do, I, I've never seen just the BW. I always remember it as the Best Western at, from the other picture as well. And I, I've been noticing more Best Western hotels that have been there that I've never like, paid attention to before. Um, so there's, there's a little bit more that, that was going on than the logo change is what I began to pick up. Now, a new logo is always a sign of growth. It represents deep change within an organization, and it could also represent a merging of timelines. This could be considered <clears throat> another type of a timeline merge. So locations from other timelines are merged or, and or integrated and or harvested is this an example of when Jordy Rose of D-Wave talks about harvesting the resources of other realities? And the company, of course, would profit by that. But what if there was a way to actually, from other timelines, bring in other hotels that, that have been created and to do it in such a way that it, it kind of merges together seamlessly? Now, Best Western didn't even know this. They have two other brands. So we're in what's called a Best Western Plus right now. And they also have Best Western Premier. 
Now, with all the traveling I would, I would be doing, I would probably be going to the Best Western premiere. I'd be like, hey, is there a Best Western premiere in that town? Because I'd like to stay there. But again, something that I'd never heard of before. What's also interesting is, guess what? In this little town of Ketchum, there's two Best Westerns? That's a little like peculiar as well, something else to think about. So locations can merge into a timeline based upon an attractant quality like a magnet. Now other examples, we'll call this what's called stolen authority, has to do with the Home Depot and Home Depot. So some people have actually found, we'll call it residue, of Home Depots. Some people will be like, hey, I've got one of the old style Home Depots in my town, and they'll take a picture of it. Or Chuck E. Cheese's, or Chuck E. Cheese. I don't even know which one it is because they're just like, they're both together all the time. So just another way of looking at residue. So a lot of times people are always looking for residue. Like, I know I'm gonna find that Shazam movie someday. It's out there somewhere. <laughs> but um, have, when these timelines are inserted, that's another way for this phenomena called residue to possibly ha happen. Caution, danger. Quantum businessman says caution about this. You can use timeline merging for business purposes, but it is never to be abused. That's kind of interesting. If in the future there is a way that we can actually do this, you must always strive for the highest timeline potential because any negative use is always going to be bad karma, always going to be bad karma. So you always, when these things become more, people become more aware of this, it has to be kept in a very, very high positive level. Now, an example that could be due for karmic backlash would have to be related to craft and their timeline takeover of Stouffer's stovetop stuffing. <laughs> now think about it, because Stouffer's is something that we all know, right? There are so, ma there are so many timelines that all were Stouffer's stovetop stuffing. So, and that's one of the things I use an example when I talk to people about the Mandela effect, I usually bring up Stouffer's first. So currently Kraft stovetop stuffing is um, king of the Thanksgiving industry where Stouffer's used to be the king. 60 million boxes of stuffing are so, of, the, of Kraft stovetop stuffing are sold every year. And almost every timeline, like I said, had Stouffer's before. So isn't that an interesting way for like a brand takeover? So it's, it's a concept that I don't know how many people are talking about this, but how I've been compiling and doing my research, these are the things that all were, are within a realm of possibility. I'm sure I could feel all of your consciousness expanding a little, little, little bit more and more and more as we keep talking about these things. So now let's talk about causes of the Mandela effect. Okay, authority to cause a Mandela effect. I'm going to say Earth. Earth herself, the Earth hologram, has a, she can cause Mandela effects. Some of us as creators have authority to create Mandela effects. We all have the ability. You might consider Earth as a school for creators to learn and gain that responsibility and authority and how this works through quantum entanglement. Even in the Bible, it says, Jesus said in John 14, 12, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. So, and, and the last thing that can cause Mandela effects, these are um, positive time travelers, because time travel is also involved to a certain extent. Now, the other part of this is what's called stolen authority forces that are making Mandela effects that don't have the true authority to do it. They're stealing the authority. This could be negative time travelers with some kind of negative agenda. It could be negative organizations and technology that's accomplishing it. It could be something we could call negative multidimensional predators that feed off of our energy and create false or artificial timelines as well. Now these are, these are other deep subjects that could probably take their own presentation to talk about, but I just want to kind of like present to you this information. Now there are forces that do not want us to awaken. They, they want us to stay locked into this dream or this hologram because it keeps that, we'll call it the 1% in power. And this 1% has been benefiting from our unawareness of what reality is so that they can rule over the rest of the 99%. They seek to make the Mandela effect a form of misremembering, confabulation, 
or mental illness. And as more and more people become awakened, those negative forces seek to make corrections to the system to nullify Mandela effect discoveries. I've been noticing that this is starting to happen. But now what's happening is the system is getting overloaded and it cannot keep up. What do I mean? Well, they'll insert false information, such as a whole story about who created stovetop stuffing. And when I created my first video, Wikipedia actually changed. When I, when, when I was first putting it together, it had a whole story about stofers and how they uh, were the creators of it. And then someone named Ruth Seams at another organization act, actually. So Wikipedia stuff started changing. So the purpose is to make the hologram appear to be real and the Mandela effect explainable is just a misremembering. You just misremember that. So what do I mean? Well, to make a hologram, to make this hologram appear to be real, it must first, you must first begin your life process with amnesia. That's the best way. So when you're born, you're going down the birth canal, you're given amnesia. You don't, when you're born, you don't, you just pop into existence. Here I am, world. That's the first thing. The second thing is it has to be immersive. The hologram has to be immersive. It has to be um, ab absorption. There has to be saturation. Now, when you take these terms and you think about going to the movies, for example, you watch a good movie, you really get absorbed in the plot, don't you? And if it's something sad, you, you'll cry, or if it's something happy, you'll be all excited, etc. So you can, you can tell from yourself by movies, video games that you play. Some people really, really get into video games. Even reading a book can totally absorb you. So these are examples of how the hologram is attempting to keep you locked in to think that this is all true reality. Now, another example of losing control of the hologram includes the giraffe, okay? So giraffes recently have a new Mandela effect called dark giraffes. Has anyone heard of dark giraffes before? Okay, so that's one thing that's new. That's a Mandela effect for a lot of people. The other thing is, is what giraffes actually eat has changed and the system has not been able to keep up, update itself quickly enough. So I'm pretty sure everyone here has a pretty good idea of what giraffes eat, right? Okay, let's, let's, let's find out. I was at a zoo just two weeks ago looking at giraffes and a giraffe exhibit. Okay. 35 pounds of leaves a day and, and the zoo was requesting people to bring in leaves off of uh, tree clippings. Okay. Okay, so, so in the image here, we've got the dark giraffe. These just popped into reality. Um, for, uh, if you try to research what a dark giraffe is, they don't really understand it. At f there was first, there was a theory that older giraffes turn dark as they age. Then there was another theory that the dominant giraffes in a herd will, be, will turn dark. All kinds of theories, no one really knows exactly what that is. But what giraffes eat really bothers me now. Um, I was always taught that they were herbivores and they only ate plants, leaves. Right. Now when I started writing this presentation, there's something that Wikipedia clearly said, giraffes were herbivores. However, in this timeline, you can easily find footage of giraffes. Hi, I'm Rob the Ranger. Welcome to today's video. I hope you enjoy it. Have fun. I'm, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna watch the whole thing here. I think you guys get, kind of get the point. But basically, um, giraffes are no longer herbivores. They actually will um, eat the carcasses of dead animals. They'll even chase hyenas away f after a lion kill to get to the carcass. What? What? I've never heard of that before. Um, so there's a, there's a, in Australia, uh, Tony, who's a, he's a pure, Rothschild's giraffe, that's an interesting name for a, uh, a breed of giraffe, Rothschild's giraffe at Werribee Open Plain Zoo in Australia, he was notorious for eating dead rabbits in front of visitors. It just ruined your talk, says Goldie Pergy, formal, former visitor experience officer at Werribee. You'd explain how giraffes are herbivores and he would do that. <laughs> so 
Strange things are afoot, my friends. <laughs> now, okay, I'm not done, I'm not done. Beaver teeth, right? Beaver teeth are another example of how the system can't keep up. So the thing about with giraffes, there's all kinds of, giraffes are only herbivores, and then oh, you can find all these videos of them eating meat and eating bones and so forth. Beaver teeth are another example of how the system cannot keep up. Okay, so beaver teeth. Does anyone know what color a beaver's teeth are? And if you say white or off-white, that's cool. Okay. Beavers have always had orange teeth. Now, I don't remember that. I don't remember beaver teeth being orange. They're, uh, they, they, I was reading an article that says they're technically considered steel. They have iron inside of it, and they, they never stop growing. That's the way it was before. Beaver's teeth would always continually grow. And they turn orange because they oxidize from the iron inside their teeth. That's new for me, very new for me. And an example of how the system can't keep up has to do with cartoons, okay? I went through every cartoon I could find that had beavers in it. Not a single beaver had orange teeth. Every single beaver had white teeth in all the cartoons. So the system is not keeping up. So here was something that was new into, introduced into the reality. And however, there's all this other, other evidence that the way the reality actually is, all of the past stuff that has not kept up with it as well. So the next slide, and I tried to, oh, here's angry beavers. I'm like, oh, there's orange. Like, oh no, that's his nose. His teeth are still, his teeth are still white. Yeah, there will, yeah, there are two angry beavers. That's what it was called, two angry beavers, not the angry beavers. Is that another Mandela effect? <laughs> okay. I know, it doesn't stop, right? So now, okay, now this, this is something I thought was interesting. Is there an advantage for beavers to now have teeth made of steel? Would this be what's, what, what I'm gonna call an inserted DNA timeline upgrade with a specific purpose? Now, this is, this is fun. It just so happens that Fermilab, has anyone heard of Fermilab? They're outside of Chicago. Okay, you guys have heard it in the back. They're a large hadron collider, they're just like CERN, okay? Now, if anyone remembers, uh, CERN had a weasel problem in 2016 where a weasel broke into CERN and chewed through these big high voltage uh, cables and brought down CERN for like weeks. Um, so wouldn't it be, it's interesting because Fermilab, which is another large hadron collider outside of Chicago, it's built across these lakes. They have three beaver lodges with all these bright, shiny orange uh, teeth. I wonder what they could eat through. I wonder if they might bring down Fermilab in, in Chicago. It's, it's something fun, but it just made me think of it. It triggered a thought about the, weasel, uh, the courageous weasel getting into the, into the CERNs. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so those of us that are experiencing the Mandela effect, we're actually, we're the lucky ones. We're the fortunate ones. Because when we begin to understand what is happening and we can go from fear to love, from the negative to positive, we can be the first ones that are actually raising the vibration of the planet. And it's happening now. Our understanding of reality would make it easier for humanity to handle disclosure events, okay? Disclosure, when we think about disclosure events, you know, we think about ETs and aliens and ah, you know, whatever. Um, but wouldn't it be a little bit easier for us if we understood more of how reality works and we'd be ac accepting of it. And in my opinion, the disclosure is not gonna be just ETs. We're gonna find out that angels really exist, dragons really exist, elementals really exist, so much more. There's a lot to be disclosed. So the more people who are in a dominant frequency of love and are emitic, emitting photonic light, who are quantumly observing this reality, are influencing and changing reality. This is an awesome responsibility that we all have. We all need to, if, we, if we're in the fear frequency, we need to flip that and get into the love frequency because that's really what this is all about. Now for those of us who are creating the Mandela effect, and I believe it's true, I believe we can quantum jump and we can create our own Mandela effects, what can we do? One of the things we can do is we could we could bring back animals maybe thought to be extinct or nearing extinction. One might be the Tasmanian tiger. 
extinct since 1933. Guess what? There was a news article a couple weeks ago. The Tasmanian tiger is back. They were discovered again. Like they thought there were no more left for, I don't know, 80 years, and now they're back again. So yay, whoever brought that back, that's, that's a great one. Anytime an extinct animal comes back, that's wonderful. So if we are in a game, a school, how do we win? How do we graduate? We do the great work. What's the great work? The alchemy of consciousness. What is the alchemy of consciousness? Turning consciousness from lead to gold. How do you turn consciousness from lead to gold? Well, that's your journey to discover. But I'll give you a hint. It's relentless optimism. <laughs> Cynthia, how good can it get? That's it. You, you know what the secret is. And now, everyone, I'm going to present to you <laughs> the definitive proof that the Mandela effect is real. Are you ready? Richard Simmons never wore a headband in this reality. There we go. We could, we could just end everything right here. So, so thank you, everyone, for listening to this presentation. I hope, you, I hope you had fun. I had a lot of fun putting it together. Thank you. I have, um, I'm working on all these other videos. I want to like go into more depth and talk about all these different things and express things and learn from you guys. And it's just, it's a great sharing of information. So. Now don't go nowhere. We've got a Q&A session. Uh, anybody have any questions about what you just heard, please step on up to the mic here and ask away. I embarrass myself because my spelling's bad. I want you to go back to the word absorption. Can you do that? I think we have the technology. <laughs> What's the root word of absorption? And why would it be spelled the way it was up here? <laughs> yeah, I think it's... Here it is, and that doesn't look right to me. I mean, I, I could have misspelled you it. pronounced it with a B, not a P. Is that the right way to spell it? Or is that just me bad spelling? I, I, you, know, you know, the spell, the spell check thing is driving me crazy. I don't know if, if it's sometimes two words, one word, somehow. A lot. Yeah, it's like all. A lot. For it 2000, does. In 2008, it was one word. I called up my um, uh, brother's wife who, it was a school teacher. And, she, and I'm like, how do you, I don't understand. It's coming up as a misspelled word. How do you spell a lot? And she's like, it's two words. It was two words. Then it went back to one word. Yeah. Now it's back to two words. That's a definite flip flop for me. It's a dilemma. <laughs> try to try to win. <laughs> I was gonna say, try to win a spelling bee as a kid. You're kind of doomed. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. Anybody else have any questions? Please feel free. Okay. We like the weird ones. It may not have any Um. Oh, this is just been a curiosity of mine. It seems like you might know. I don't understand the internet. Like, where do we hold all of the information in the internet, and how is it connected to all of us? Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, okay. So the internet. Yeah. Explain the internet. Okay. So the internet is a series of servers, computer servers that hold data. Where are they? They're all over the planet. Some are in farms. They're called server farms. Some are like in bunk underground bunkers that can allegedly take a nuclear attack. So they're all over the planet. Some people have them in their, in their basement, in their house, like their kids use a, a game server and their other friends all connect into it. So servers can be anywhere. They could be in a farm. They could be individual. They could be in a business. And then using routers, mm -hmm. um, you can connect into those into those servers and it knows the right path to take. It's like a big web and it based upon the IP address, which is like a phone number, it knows exactly what server to go to and extract. Oh. Or so there isn't one location that we're all connecting to? It's um, no. And that's, that's, why they, they, that's why the whole purpose of the internet was put together too so that if like a, a country went down or something, you can still get access to data, like a certain part of the world could be under attack or servers can go down someplace else and other servers, it would just flow around it. And so in these servers, 
What's holding the information? Is there crystals or what's holding the information? It's usually um, some kind of like um, hard drive technology. Hard, what are those made of? What's that? What are they made of? Yeah, I think ultimate, yeah, ultimately. Silicone. So, so silicone. that would be a crystal, chris is silicone yeah. a crystal? Yeah. yeah. There are crystals, yeah. Okay. That's all that I have. Okay. Okay, no, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, now that you said that question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something funny because um, in, the, in the 90s, I started another business uh, which was an internet service provider. And in this little town in Connecticut, I had about 5,000 subscribers that would like dial. This is the time before DSL and cable modems became popular. And um, um, now I already forgot what I was going to say. But um, what was your question? Okay, okay, thank you. So I used to teach these classes about um, the internet. You know, I go to the, li the local library and like the senior citizens would want to know like how to use the internet and how to send email to their kids and stuff. And I would always talk about the internet and the World Wide Web and how it was developed by the US Navy and a guy named Vince Cerf developed the World Wide Web. Now what's happened is that CERN is claiming responsibility for ownership of, of creating the World Wide Web. Now for some reason Vince Cerf has worked for CERN, and if you go to CERN, you could find the original computer that he created the World Wide Web on. And I'm like, what? That, I used to teach that. That was, that was never there. But by that timeline insertion, it gives them authority over the internet. So if you were to go, as an example, um, if you were to go to Google, okay, and type in Mandela Effect, guess what the first, maybe we should try this. Okay, Mandela Effect. M -A -M -A -M -A. Yeah. <laughs> okay, hold on a second. No, sorry, YouTube. I meant YouTube. Mandela Effect. Okay, let's see who comes up first. Oh, now it's coming up second. Okay, this one here from Fermilab always used to come up first. So Fermilab is a Large Hadron Collider. Um, they work in sync with CERN. So CERN almost gave itself the authority of the internet to be like, oh, we're the creators of the World Wide Web. It gives them authority so that different things and different searches and so forth, they would come up at least towards the top. And by the way, if anyone ever wants to play this particular video, it's actually pretty hysterical. It's this guy at Fermilab talking to um, his dog, Albert, about how crazy the Mandela effect is. And then while he's talking to his dog, Albert, the dog turns into a cat. And uh, <laughs> I just feel bad for the dog and the cat in the video, but it, it's kind of like it really, maybe don't watch it because it kind of puts you down. But it was really interesting how that video would always come up first. Even though it didn't have as many hits as the other videos, et cetera, that would always come up first. But, yeah, sometimes that there are ways that uh, using these timeline insertions, et, et cetera, you can, you can gain authority over different types of things like the internet. Hey, we have authority over the internet because we created the World Wide Web. So that was a good question. I got a question. You spoke a lot about different timelines and timeline jumping and the possibility that we could jump from one train track to the other, if you will, which I really thought that was a great example there. I, I like that. I'm going to have to use that myself. Uh, but the question is, do you know of any personal uh, exercises or things you would use to make those jumps? Anything we should do personally to, to try to affect our, our jumps and our movements? Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. And I know, like, Cynthia and her book has a, has a lot of... I would even ask Cynthia to a answer that question if you wanted to. Okay. Yeah, but basically there, there is a way going into a, a meditative type state and... Um, feeling yourself relax into a situation and having that intention, people have been able to actually change their reality. And sometimes they even do it subconsciously. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are such creators, they have the power to do that, and they, it happens to them all the time. So, But as soon as I... Uh, that could be a whole other topic yeah. as well, like how, how well, to quantum... Well, i got to say, you know...
uh, this right here, I honestly think we manifested this podium. I am not even joking. So when I first come down here to check out this room, there was no podium. And I had no way to get none. I didn't know any local churches, had no contacts, had no way to get a podium. And I sure wasn't going to buy one. So this right here is the one that I had in my head for three weeks. I mean, the design, the color style, everything. So I come in the other day, and I, they asked, well, can we see the room to set it up? Sure. I come in, that thing sitting right here, and I just leaned right on it. Oh, my goodness, we've got a podium. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out they had just put it together yesterday morning. I really think we manifested that in the reality by doing just that, by having that. Yeah, you that think you're thinking about it and you wanting it and you embrace the love of the universe and yeah, we need that podium here. It Absolutely. is. Absolutely, I really think a lot of that had to do with bringing that in. Thank yeah. you, sir. Yeah. Oh no. Thank whoever. Thank you for manifesting the podium. <laughs> I, if I had to hold this laptop the whole time, that wouldn't have worked out. So that would have been kind of heavy after a while. Anybody else have any questions? Step on up to the mic. Line up. I wanted to uh, say that like, I'm kind of into like etymology and stuff. And if you look at the idea that like a mandala, the definition would be a sigil that's powered by intention to make a change in the universe or cosmos. And it start kind of brought up like some um, fear for me in the beginning with it because I felt like if you look at like the logos capital T capital L and like the as above so below kind of thing and like businesses have logos so those would be like sigils to maybe um, make their company prosper and it makes me wonder if there's a chance that there's not a couple of things going on where there's like this natural Mandela effect thing going on, but then also maybe there's people trying to like imitate it where they can do things to like throw us off and make us doubt things because, and I feel like that may have a lot to do with how come there's a lot of celebrity names changing and brand names and stuff like that. But then when you look at the universe, we have things like, you know, um, maps changing and the rainbow mountains and things like yeah. that yeah so um i just thought that maybe it should be brought up because if you know some people might think that way too and uh if so so if anyone heard that if they had that opinion so it would got brought up so like the mandela being like the, the word using etymo uh, etymology meaning change Right, or, you know, yeah, but um, intentionally, like, um, by some, like, as, like doing it purposely. That's okay. what I'm saying. Just kind of like when you go to the movie, when people all go to the movies, you have, like, a movie theater full of people, and they're all focusing with emotion mm -hmm. on whatever it is that mm -hmm. people think that we should watch. And they're all in a group together, working hard, focusing on it, and it can help bring about a change that maybe we don't want and someone else does. Like, say, like, the San Andreas Fault movie or something. Yeah, exactly, you know? exactly. So, that, I yeah, just wanted people to point are powerful. That Yeah, no, people in our consciousness are pretty powerful. And once we know how to tap into that as a, as a group, boy, we're, we're really super powerful, so. It's important to point, just point out that it probably is important to, like, not participate in those kind of things, you know, that could bring about negative things. Absolutely, keep it positive, yes. Love all the way up, scale of one to 10, it's a 10. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. I wanted to say to you though, is that I understand what Microphone. you're saying. Microphone. Yeah, I understand what you're saying about the sigils and what you're talking about is uh, mathematics and geometry. So that's how the invisible and antimatter comes into matter through different geometries and mathematics and if you look at groups uh, secret societies the masons and if you look at uh, you know their their uh, compass etc it's showing you that um, certain geometries can create inversion certain geometries have a, our body right now we have for example a carbon-based geometry in our cells we're saying if we evolve it gets to a different 
uh, structure in mathematics and in geometries. So people who have knowledge and power, like let's say the swastika, was a very, very positive symbol from the Vedic text. And that was used because it holds power over us. So people who do have knowledge and want to use it for service to self or service to others can use geometries to kind of pinpoint or focus our consciousness into what they wish to create or present. Right. Yes. Thank you. Okay, this is a two-part one, but it'll be quick. Okay, Cynthia was talking about the quantum Zeno effect, which is basically the effect that um, people who are experts in the field, like say doctors, don't always notice, uh, supposedly don't always notice changes in, in their own profession. Also, we've discussed a lot online about how locals often don't notice changes to their own geographic area. Now, um, are, do you notice changes in your geographic area, or do people say that it's changed and you don't think it did? And do you notice, do you feel that you have any of that problem with your own work, or do you notice all the Emmys in your own work? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because that's something that actually does happen to me a lot. Um, for example, there's this route that I would always, um, well, actually, even when I was younger, I'd always ride my, my bike down this, this uh, road by, this, by the Long Island Sound, so to speak, by all, through all these marshes. And then I would, on my way to work, I'd drive a car there. So for 20 years, I've been driving down this road. And then one, one day, all of a sudden, these two islands popped up in, in, this, in this waterway. And I'm like, whoa, what was that? They were never there before. And then a house had this big sundial on the side of the house that was never there before. And I'm like, when did that happen? Because literally the day before it wasn't there, the next day it was there. And I was going by the house, I had my son in the car, and I had him go out and ask the people how long that sundial has been on the side of the house. They didn't give him an answer, they just said a really long time. <laughs> so yeah, so those type of things definitely, um, you know, as far as geography, I'm definitely very much aware of. And even in my business, there'll be a lot of curious things that go on especially with my programmers, so that they're, they're convinced that they wrote a program you know, that w was doing things a certain way in our main application, and then it's not there anymore, and, or, or vice versa. There's something there, and like, who wrote that? Like, we don't, yeah, so there are those type of things that happen as well. Yeah, so I've, yeah, we're, when you start tuning into Mandela effects, you become really hyper aware. So if you have a doctor that's really into Mandela effects, you may want to go to someone else. <laughs> that's probably what my advice would be. Yeah. Now, why do you think that is that some people seem to not see their local ones? Even some of the Mandela affected swear that their area has not changed, but you can still see them. Yeah, they call that, uh, that concept is like being in your own bubble of reality. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if you, when you're in your own bubble of reality, things are a certain way but people from other bubbles of reality, or when your bubble of reality merges with another burble, burble, bubble of reality, then those things start to become apparent. But it's a deep, it's a deep subject with, mm -hmm. I'm sure, a more easier answer than that. But yeah, those are all really, really good questions. They're Thank all you. gonna be figured out. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm about 99.9999996 percent sure that yeah, we're going to figure it out. Pretty, yeah, 12 nines and a six percent. I'm pretty sure we will. We have to. I believe that we have to. Okay. Sure. So, um, in uh, your perspective, what do you imagine could? Be, uh, I got two questions. What uh, do you imagine? Yeah. What do you imagine? <laughs> Imagine uh, that could be Mandela'd into the timeline in positive effects as well as into the, the aspect of uh, like mining for resources for other timelines. Of course, that could be taken negatively or be done in a unity fashion. So what, what do I imagine a, a positive timeline to be? Is that like of what could be uh, brought in in resources to this timeline that could possibly affect it? Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to think about that. There's, there actually probably are an unlimited amount of positive things. Um, one of the things that I always get concerned about is, um, is history. I'm very much into history. 
and seeing history change bothers me, seeing history being erased bothers me, seeing history um, just not different from the way other people. I would like our true history to be restored. I would like us to, to actually understand, did civilizations like Atlantis actually exist? Were, were they true? Like in all these fable, mythical places, did they actually exist? Were they just stories? Or were they part of a reality, another reality that's been erased from, from this hologram? So to answer your question, that's the first thing that I would, that I would think of. Mm -hmm. nice. um, in more into your personal experience in like other timelines and other timeline versions of you and like going into that story where you had a, um, a deviation in the timeline where you could have made health um, software. Um, do you imagine that a lot of people have this similar thing where they have all these different versions of themselves creating different things in their career path? And how do you express that in a business sense? Yeah, I, I almost think that almost every time you blink your eyes, you're almost like you're, you're going, you can go on another timeline, you can make decisions that branch off. And so you decide to go to work one day instead of another day and you get into a car accident but you wound up meeting someone that's ex extremely important in your life and that changes everything. And um, you know, so there's all these different types of potentials and things that could possibly happen. So yeah, there's almost, almost infinite type of possibilities and a lot of them could be really super positive. We just have to be unpredictable. Sometimes we just have to get out of what we're, the, the normal little rut that life puts us in to get into something, into an unpredictable route. And that leads to all these other amazing timelines that can manifest themselves. Uh, and will you be working on the ability to um, bring in data, memory, and awareness from these other timelines to help you succeed? Wouldn't that, no, that's a great, that's a great topic because what if, okay, let's say there are, we've got a thousand other timelines that are running from other decisions that we've made that we've actually gained all of this information. We've gained knowledge, we've gained wisdom, we've gained skills. Let's say there was another timeline where we, we really focused on playing the violin really well or some, some instrument and we became really, really skilled at that. Wouldn't it be totally awesome if we can take those skills and all the knowledge that we learned from that timeline and bring it into this timeline? And those type of things go on and on and on. Different educational choices. You could have been a neurosurgeon, let's say, in another timeline, or, or whatever it is. Or you spoke three other languages. If you could bring that knowledge into the timeline that you're in now, that would be pretty amazing. And that would help humanity really advance to another level. And you kind of, have, you've already done the work. So in the other timelines, you spent all this time practicing the violin. Hey, let's bring it into this timeline and, and enjoy that. Do you think that's amazing? Do I think that's available to us now? That's still there. I, th I, th um, I think that it's available to us now, but I don't know if we know how to actually do it yet. Okay. But it seems that it's logical, and I'm sure someone someplace has already figured it out. But now that, that the public is getting into all these, there's going to be more things that become apparent. And I actually even think things like quantum computers, a lot of people are scared of them. But I believe there's going to be some amazing things that, that happen with quantum computers. Some really, really amazing things. Next question. All right. First off, I loved your presentation. Really interesting stuff, like the U-boats. Um, and I love the relentlessly optimistic. That's fantastic. So I have a couple questions. First off, Mandela effects. To me, it seems like they're increasing in frequency and also in drasticness. Would you agree with that? I would. How about you guys? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're just like <laughs> intensifying. Like almost, almost every day or so, there's new stuff. In personal ones, there are big ones too. Right, right. And it's getting more interesting and more drastic to me, I believe. Since you're into computers, you must be uh, familiar with the artificial intelligence concepts and the singularity that people are talking about when computers get to that point where they become smart enough to think for themselves and they reach that special point where they can go to the next level. 
That's the artificial intelligence singularity. So do you think that the Mandela effect is going to end up reaching a Mandela effect singularity based on the exponential increasing of Mandela effects that are occurring? I, I, I definitely believe that more and more people are going to become creators of their own Mandela effects and that is going to be happening more and more. I, I also feel too like I'm going to call it something like a dead man switch but I'm going to say that as you begin to understand how Mandela effects work and how you can actually manifest them in your life, um, you have to be at a certain positive frequency and vibration for that usually to even happen. So as you keep growing and as your consciousness, you do the great work and you turn your the consciousness turns from lead to gold, so to speak, you only want to do things that help and improve and make things beautiful and bring animals back from extinction and pollution issues are cleared up, you know, those those type of things. So I believe that that's going to be happening more and more and more in a very positive, 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 positive way. But right now we're kind of in a it's like a big soup right now. We're trying to figure it all out. Negative stuff, positive stuff. Yeah, trying to put it all together. So now I'm going to ask you an impossible question. Based on if you were to outline a graph of the increasingness of number of Mandela effects and the increasingness of the drasticness or the uh, power of the Mandela effects, when do you think the singularity would happen? One year, two years, 20 years? Oh, I'm going to probably say... Tomorrow? No, 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 no <laughs> definitely not tomorrow. Yes. Well, but, well, never say never. But I, I would think it's got to be within five or ten years that it's going to really... I mean, we're, we're, I mean, you can ask me this question five years from now. I don't think it's going to be a hundred years, but it's definitely... Whatever is happening is really intensifying for us to understand that we actually do create our, our own reality. And how we feel inside like really affects and attracts people. So if we're of a really happy, positive vibration, all of a sudden we find all these happy, positive people around us. And if we're always like negative and this isn't working out for me, and blah, then you know, we attract that type of vibration as well. And who wants to feel that way? Everyone wants to feel good and happy. So as people begin to realize they can manifest all those really good and happy things, it's just gonna go more and more and more. The whole Mandela effect thing is like so special. Like it's really, special and it's kind of a shame that the scientific community or the world at large thinks that it's a, a, a mass misremembering of things because it's really one of the most amazing things that's happening to us that's ever happened to the human race especially that now we can communicate these things we've got the internet we could talk to each other and we keep growing and growing and they're happening more and more so thank you okay thank you ladies and gentlemen mr chris and <laughs>